Thank you, Daniel, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ricardo. And my name is Miles. And today we're presenting Don't Mesh Around. Microarchitectural side channels with their ability to leak secret information and break process isolation have inspired a wide variety of research over the past decade. However, prior work has primarily focused on structures within the cores and the caches. In our work, we study a microarchitectural attack surface that remains open even when these vectors are closed, specifically the on-chip interconnect. Now, previously, this was thought to be infeasible and is largely ignored by existing defenses. On-chip interconnects come in a variety of different topologies. Prior work studying interconnects has focused primarily on client-class processors, which might use smaller interconnects like the ring. In our work, we study a much larger interconnect since vendors are increasingly moving to these larger uh, topologies as processor core counts continue to increase. Specifically, we study the mesh interconnect found on the latest Intel server processors. Now, Intel's mesh is composed of a two-dimensional array of tiles where each tile can contain up to one core. These cores can send messages to one another by injecting packets onto the interconnect. Now, the two-dimensional nature of this interconnect adds a variety of different challenges when compared to the ring architecture. For instance, there are simply many more ways to traffic flows to interfere with one another, not to mention simply many more placement options for these traffic flows. In light of this complexity, we ask two research questions. First, is it feasible to construct attacks by only exploiting contention on a mesh interconnect? And second, are there non-invasive approaches that can mitigate these attacks without requiring hardware modifications? In our work, we find that not only are such side channels feasible, but also that despite the deeply integrated nature of the interconnect, it is in fact possible to reduce this leakage without changing any hardware. Before we dive too much into attacks and defenses, however, we must first understand a little bit more about the mesh. In this first part of the talk, we will reverse engineer the workings of Intel server class mesh interconnect with a specific focus on understanding how traffic flows interfere with one another. Now, we rely on a similar approach to prior work, which takes advantage of the fact that last level cache loads to a cache slice that is not local to your core must necessarily travel along the interconnect. In this way, we can issue continuously and repeatedly many loads to a remote last level cache slice to create a transmitter that will spam the network with traffic packets. Similarly, we can issue many such packets and time these loads to create a receiver which will monitor traffic along a particular path. Now, if the receiver observes an increase in the latency, then we say that the receiver has observed contention. This naturally raises the question, what might cause the receiver to observe contention? To get a better handle on this, we can intuitively imagine one row of the interconnect as a two-lane way of traffic. So in this model, tiles can inject traffic onto the road and the traffic can exit the road onto any tile. With this model, you might assume that perhaps two traffic flows that are overlapping and traveling in the same direction, since they share the same path, might have the ability to interfere with one another. And in practice, when we test many different placements, we find that sometimes this is true, but not always. In fact, these two conditions are insufficient. Let's take a look at this case right here. So these two flows obey the two rules we've described. They're overlapping and they're traveling in the same direction. However, in the second case, where we flip the transmitter and the receiver, the contention disappears. This suggests to us that in the second case, the receiver's flow is unable to be slowed by the transmitter. Another way to say this is that the receiver's flow has higher priority in the second case. Speaking more generally, there are three different ways in which traffic might enter a tile. It can come from the column, from the row, or it can be injected from the local cache or core. Now, by testing many different placements, we can exercise these different conditions and reverse engineer the priorities between these different flows. We discuss more details about this in the paper, but the key takeaway here is that transmitter traffic must have higher priority in order to delay the receiver's traffic. All right, so now we've got three rules. We ask, is this sufficient? Well, let's take a look at these two cases here. They follow all three rules we've described, same direction, uh, overlapping, and the transmitter has higher priority. And yet, once again, in the second case, when we see that we've shifted the receiver by one tile to the right, the contention disappears. This leads us to conclude that perhaps in the second case, the receiver is not using the same lane as in the first case. That is to say, whereas we've previously been envisioning the mesh kind of like this, it might be more appropriate to see it as something like this, where there are two lanes going in either direction. Naturally, this raises the question, how does traffic pick which lane to use? Once again, we can test a variety of different uh, placements, and we can observe some patterns here. 
Most surprisingly is that the rules are different when traveling vertically and horizontally on the mesh. Traveling horizontally, the lane selection is dependent on the destination of the traffic flow, whereas when traveling vertically, it's dependent on the source. Furthermore, when traveling vertically, we see, for instance, when going from row zero to row one, there are even special cases here. So the lane selection algorithm is non-trivial. The key takeaway from all this, though, is that traffic must travel on the same lane in order to contend. As a final note, we've been depicting the mesh in this way right here. However, the reality is a little bit more complex. Our reverse engineering reveals that uh, the actual situation contains a fair bit more infrastructure. For instance, every connection is actually implemented as a pair of rings, and Intel's communication protocol actually requires four different types of packets, which means that the structure that you see here is actually duplicated four times. Now, for the remainder of this talk, uh, we'll ignore a lot of these details, but instead focus instead on the security implications of this design. All right, so let's go back to the research questions that we asked at the beginning of this presentation and look at two examples of security implications for attackers and two for defenders. Let's start from the ones for attackers. The first example of a security implication for attackers is a covert channel. And what we show in the paper is that the mesh interconnect can be used to establish a very reliable communication channel between two processes, even when these two processes are isolated in the cores and in the caches. This covert channel can, for example, encode ones and zeros as different levels of interconnect contention. We show in the paper that this covert channel can achieve capacities of over 1.5 megabits per second, which is on par with state-of-the-art uh, covert channels that do not rely on shared memory. And we also show that it works across virtual machines. Here is an example of a latency trace that decodes to a sequence of alternating zeros and ones. Let's now briefly discuss the second example of a security implication for attackers, which is a side channel attack on cryptographic code. We target a cryptographic victim that features the code pattern shown in the slide. This code pattern has been exploited many times by prior work, but we are showing here that it can leak either over this more complex structure, which is the mesh interconnect. The way that it works is that an attacker can set itself up to detect the execution of these two functions, function one and function two. For example, here are two traces corresponding to the first iteration of this victim's loop. As you can see, in the trace to the left, the, um, there is an execution of function one that is clearly visible. But in the trace to the right, we can see that both function one and function two execute, and their execution is visible through interconnect contention. We provide many details about how this side channel can work in the paper, and, well, and we also generalize this approach to all the subsequent iterations of the victim. But for the sake of this presentation, we are also going to focus on another important aspect that is also providing new insights on interconnect side channel attacks. And this aspect is the one of the attacker's placement. As we will see, this is also important for mitigations. So let's look at an example. Consider we have this scenario where the victim runs on the top left corner of the processor. Now, during the victim's execution, we expect to see traffic into and out of every slice. This is, by the way, due to the way that the slice hash function is designed on modern Intel processors. So now we can ask the question, what is the best attacker's placement? Is it this one, or maybe this one here? Or maybe is it that one on the first row? Turns out answering this question is non-trivial because on our processor, which is not even one of the largest ones that uses a mesh, there are 575 different placements options for the attacker. So in our paper, to rank these placements, we built an analytical model that works like this. The analytical model takes as an input all the information that we learned in the first part of this talk, including the priority arbitration policy, the lane scheduling policy, the different flows in different rings, and then it takes as an input a victim's core and an attacker's placements, like the three ones that we showed in the previous slide. It computes the number of links that are shared between the victim and the attacker under this different placement. And then it returns a normalized score from 0 to 10, where 10 is the best score we ever saw on our processor, and 0 means that the attacker and the victim share no links, so the attacker will not be able to observe any contention. Let's see more concretely what the analytical model actually does. 
Here is an example with the attacker running on the fourth row, the uh, fourth column of the first row, and the victim still in the same position as before. Of all the victim's flows that you can see here in red, the only ones that the attacker can observe in these specific placements are these ones. So this is really not a particularly good placement. In fact, it only achieves a low score. By the way, the reason why the attacker can only see these, these flows is because those are the only flows that share a link with the attacker in this placement. However, let's look at another placement where we only shift the attacker by one position. So we shifted the attacker left by one core. As it turns out, due to the complexity of this mesh interconnect, this placement is a particularly good one, and all the flows that are shown in the slide are actually observable by the attacker in this placement. In fact, this placement is one of the best ones in our processor. It achieves a score of 10. We also saw that this placement works much, much better to mount side channel attacks against cryptographic code. And you can find more details in the paper. But the reason why I showed you all this was really to introduce the mitigations part of this talk. As we saw here, when that victim runs on the top left corner, there is a placement where the attacker can achieve a score of 10. So let's look at this in another way. When the victim runs on that core, the maximum score that the attacker can achieve is 10. So this is not a very good core for the victim to pick. However, what we found is that if we choose another victim core, for example, the victim could run on the second column, third row, the maximum score that the attacker can achieve is much lower, and it is four. So a very simple non-invasive mitigation that we can already use is to schedule cryptographic software to run on the least vulnerable cores, which already significantly reduces the efficacy of the attack. And we evaluated that this actually decreases significantly the, the efficacy of the attack. But we can even do better, because this one only reduces the score so far. And to introduce the second mitigation, I will give you another example. Suppose that the victim runs on the third row of the first column. Once again, we can ask the question, what is the best placement for the attacker? Now, in this plot, we show the best scores that the attacker can achieve when running on all the different 23 cores that are available on our processor. It turns out that the best score here is 9, when the attacker runs on the third row of the third column. However, Notice that there is only one core where the attacker can really achieve this high score. So naturally, we can ask the question, can we prevent the attacker from taking that core? Since we are defenders, we can just play with the operating system scheduler. And in fact, we can schedule trusted software to run on that core, trusted software that belongs to the same security domain as the victim, and then prevent the attacker from taking that core. And just by doing so, which only requires changes to the scheduler, we already reduced the score from 9 to 3. And even better, if we want even more isolation, we can additionally schedule trusted software to run on three more cores and reduce the score all the way down to 1. This means that defenders can reserve certain cores for the victim's security domain to reduce the efficacy of the attack. Now, going forward, we could even envision better mitigations by, for example, combining these with slice partitioning. For example, we saw in the previous talk some many, many solutions exist to provide cache partitioning. However, that would require extra hardware support that is not yet available. To conclude our talk, we also want to encourage you to check out our GitHub repository, which has the, our, the code for all the experiments in our paper. And with that, we would like to conclude our talk, and we are happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention.